This video is focusing on the properties of aluminum uh, and most specifically structural aluminum, although we will also talk extensively about sort of semi-structural applications such as window mullion systems where the primary issue is the engagement of the glass uh, and the structural function is uh, somewhat less significant. Aluminum comes with many different alloys. In fact, aluminum is so incredibly versatile in terms of its alloying that that's actually been a problem for the industry. So for years they would talk about the unbelievable variety of properties that they could produce and then it finally dawned on them that they were just confusing everyone to such a degree that they set a policy of sort of drastically reducing whatever they bothered to promote and that turned out to be good from their industry point of view. Aluminum designations look something like this. This says 6061 T6. The 6061 gives alloy content and the T6 means that it has been tempered to level 6. Um, I don't even remember myself what 6061 stands for, but it has to do with uh, percentages of various things that are added. The maximum temper is level 12. T12 is almost never attempted except in exotic aircraft and super high-end bicycle frames. Um, Aluminum is susceptible to fatigue over billions of stress cycles. In this process, it can detemper from T12 to T10. Um, it can also develop stress fractures that can render it unsuitable for service. Um, <clears throat> this limits the lifetime of aluminum aircraft, and in particular, the front fork on a bicycle, which takes a lot of abuse and goes through many stress cycles. It's not uncommon for an, a really high-end aluminum bike frame to come with a carbon fiber front fork because of this issue of fatigue. The common alloy and grade of aluminum that is used for structural applications in the construction industry is 6061T6. It has a yield stress of 35 KSI, a stiffness of 10,100 KSI, and a density of 165 pounds per cubic foot. And you can get all kinds of different kinds of structural aluminum and you can fine tune it. But generally speaking, if you just go in and ask for a structural grade of aluminum, this is what you get. And this is the common material <coughs> that they would stock for structural purposes. It represents a good balance in terms of being strong without being excruciatingly hard to extrude. It also has reasonably good resistance to corrosion and good resistance to deep tempering, um, which some of the higher stress grades doesn't, don't have. Uh, for window framing, there are a few much softer alloys. They have yield stresses closer to 15 KSI. These are chosen over the structural grade. In other words, over the 6061T6, these alloys are chosen because they are much easier to extrude with really fine details and they are much more resistive to corrosion, allowing them to maintain a good appearance over decades of exposure to the weather, which is absolutely crucial on the facade of a building. Most of the common grades of aluminum can be welded fairly effectively. However, the extremely high thermal conductivity of the aluminum makes it very difficult to maintain the right temperature in the welding process. It also, it is often necessary to preheat the base material so that the temperature differential between the base material and the weld is not so great. This uh, makes a much more effective weld and also reduces uh, differential stresses in the cooling process. Generally, it requires a much more skilled welder for aluminum than for steel, and welding is not a common thing that you would tend to do for aluminum applications in buildings. Aluminum machines easily and cleanly 
for sawing, punching, and drilling. It has some uh, tendency under threading to gore, but generally can be done pretty effectively in that application also. One of the most profound things about aluminum is that it can be extruded in a single operation in very complex shapes, and as such, aluminum <laughs> is, <laughs> is almost a perfect mediator in curtain wall applications where it has to be structural, but it also has to have fine details to incorporate neoprene gaskets and other details. So we'll talk further about that as we go further along. <clears throat> okay, so <clears throat> this is the way aluminum is delivered to a factory operation. Uh, in this case, these are rods, 10 inches in diameter. They come at this length and then they get sliced at different lengths depending upon what sections are going to be extruded and uh, also the operations of the particular facility that's doing the work. So in this case, if these are 10 inches, these appear to be three feet or maybe 40 inches long. So these pieces were cut out of that, and these are sometimes referred to as billets, analogous to the terminology we use in steel. Except in steel, we roll the billets. In aluminum, we can actually extrude it, and we'll get clear what that means. All right, so here are some of these aluminum bullets, billets, I should say, being uh, carried on this ramp into the furnace where they're going to be heated up uh, and how hot they're heated uh, depends on the alloy but probably around 700 degrees um, so generally the cost of these materials is much higher and the uh, shapes that we can extrude are generally much smaller so this billet here that's 10 inches in diameter is is a substantial amount of aluminum, but it would be considered a measly amount of material compared to a steel billet from which we might be rolling out some super jumbo section. Um, I should say that we're looking at a so-called 10 inch extruder. These are 10 inch rods that are going into this furnace. Uh, 12 inches in the commercial sector is about as large as you can get. There are some 16 inch extruders, but they're almost exclusively used by the military and pretty much got built for the military, so they're not really readily accessible. And if you got into them, they'd probably be very expensive. So if you imagine this was a 12 inch circle, anything you extrude has to be within that circle and generally speaking, they encourage you not to get too close to the edge. So <coughs> for a 12 inch uh, billet, you probably want to stay within a circle of about 11 inches or so. And for a 10 inch, you want to stay within a circle of about nine inches or so. Uh, and when you really want to know the correct answer to that, you'd uh, contact the, the company you intend to work with in terms of these kinds of extrusions. So, these billets come out of the oven, and here we have a billet right here, and here we have a hydraulic device, this huge round cylinder is a hydraulic cylinder that rams the steel rod, which rams this uh, billet, and it's basically going to force it through a die and um, I've noticed in my dealings with the aluminum people I'm always after a structural product 6061 T6 they always wince a little bit when I ask for that because it's clearly harder to drive that harder material and they would always prefer to do something around 15 KSI so that's the first thing they'll do is try and talk you out of the higher stress grade um, and maybe you can do that or maybe you can't, but you'll have to think about it. Okay, so this is looking at that hydraulic device 
after it's driven this rod uh, deep into the heart of this device that contains the die. Now this is an example of part of a die. Um, this is like super thick, super strong steel and it has been laser cut to produce these shapes and all of this has been carefully engineered to facilitate the flow. Now you'll notice this right here represents the inside. If I, I'll go through this and make sure I'm getting this right. Yes. This little rod right here represents the um, inside of a tube that's going to be extruded. And the interesting thing about tubes, of course, is you have to ask yourself, how are you actually making it hollow inside? And the answer is you're extruding aluminum through here, you're extruding it there and there and there, and you're providing this smooth path for those pieces of aluminum to rejoin on each other. So there's a, a curious process here where the combination of enormous pressure and elevated temperature is keeping the aluminum close enough to a liquid state that it can refuse on itself. Now, the pressures that are required to do this are enormous, so I shouldn't really be calling it a fluid. Um, it has to come out of this whole th thing stiff enough to hold its shape, so it's clearly not a fluid. But we have this very high temperature and high pressure, which is allowing these four paths of aluminum to reconnect to each other and create the tube that's going to go around us. So if we take this piece and we lift it up, this is what it looks like, and I'm sorry that this is so fuzzy, but basically the aluminum is going to get driven through these holes by this huge piston, and these four channels of aluminum are going to reconverge. So if I look at this side, this defines the outside of that tube, and what's in there defines the inside. And in this process, we're going to be able to get a hollow shape coming out. So this is really nice. Uh, it's pretty high tech. It's a lot of trouble to make the dies, but it's a lot better than steel tube, where we have to go through this uh, <coughs> elaborate forming process and use huge welders and everything has to be so perfectly uh, balanced in order to make it work. Here we just put in this combination of two dies, one of which is going to um, create the inside shape and one of which is creating the outside shape. And I might add, by the way, that when this is put in the device, you'll notice some little bolts here. <laughs> Those little bolts have no role whatsoever except to keep everything aligned. And this entire die is going to get rammed up against a shoulder that will come in right here. So there's a super monster thick steel shoulder that this thing rests against. So in the f actual operation, there's not much stress on these bolts. The real stress is everything is pressing up against that shoulder. So this is a slightly closer up view. So this shows you the outside diameter and the inside diameter of um, the tubing that's going to come out of this process. Now you can actually do a whole bunch of different tubes because if you're doing small tubes and you got this giant bullet, um, billet, <laughs> I keep saying that, uh, you want to be able to uh, drive um, a lot of material and form a lot of material at once. So. Here's a, here's a die that's basically got four of these things that are establishing the inside diameter of the tubing. And then uh, this is the face piece that goes on the other side that establishes the outside diameter. So they're literally going to have four of these pieces of aluminum flying out of this machine uh, as they're doing the extruding. And by the way, this hydraulic device rams this stuff through there at an amazing speed. Okay, so as material comes out, it might be cooled by water to help temper it, but also to 
help stiffen it up so it doesn't sag too much. Uh, it may also be cooled by air, depending upon what they're trying to accomplish. The air would cool it a little bit less, but may turn out to be uh, the ideal way to handle certain alloys. This is what some of the material looks like when it comes out. It's not terribly impressive in terms of how straight it is. Uh, these are simple, I think, one inch by two inch uh, rectangular pieces. This material, which is kind of crooked, and it was a little limp when it came out, and in fact over here you see some really grotesque deformations. Um, what they do is they take this kind of material and they put it on the stretcher. So here's a guy who's going to basically clamp it on this end. There's another guy who's going to clamp it on that end, and they're going to stretch it straight. So that's a pretty crucial part of this forming operation. So you notice all these teeth on here. That's what they use to grab hold of that material uh, to do the stretching operation. And right here, I show you an example of the original extruded material. And then this is the straightened out piece. So when they do the straightening, they not only end up with a straighter piece, but they end up with a better uh, temper or grade of material. And this particular pattern on the surface is one of the things they look for in that process. Okay, so here are a bunch of different shapes that can be extruded. Here we got a thin walled square tube, a slightly thicker walled or smaller square tube an angle. Uh, we have odd shapes like a curved portion here and I don't even know what that might be but this is probably a little neoprene gasket but I'm not quite sure what this is for but these are indicators of the fact that there are a lot of pretty complicated things that you can generate if you want to. Um, we mentioned that aluminum has an extremely high thermal conductivity uh, I stayed in a hotel in Chicago once and did this little experiment. I put my hand on the, the sill and it was really clear there was no thermal break and the sill on the inside of the building was unbelievably cold. So I just poured some beads of water on that sill and in almost no time the water was frozen. Um, you don't really want to do that in Chicago. This was an older hotel and one would hope in newer hotels the do things more rationally. But here you have this special extruded shape that allows you to put some kind of a thermal break in here, which still you hope is going to be pretty structural, but will reduce the thermal conduction. You need to be careful about things like this though, because it's often tempting to make this really wide to make it strong. And if you make that pathway wide enough, you don't accomplish very much in terms of creating a thermal break. Okay, so here are some other shapes. This is some corrugated decking material. This is a common shape that they use for bleachers. Uh, so you'll notice they've created like little eye sections here, but then the top of the eye section is the deck. So this is like a quadruple T or something like that. And all that was done in one extrusion. And I think the depth of this is like an inch and a half or less. Uh, so they're able to get an 11 inch wide piece of decking for people to sit on in the stands. Um, here's a common trick that we've played with aluminum in various firms that I've been involved in. This was a very long extrusion which was given this shape and then it gets sawn here and sawn there. So in other words, even though it was extruded as a long piece, it's intended to be chopped up into little pieces and the benefits of all this special shape is crucial. In this case, uh, this is for scaffolding and this hook, when the thing's turned upside down, this hook hooks over the tubing of the scaffolding and that allows people to be secure that they know that the scaffolding uh, deck is in place, but it's really easy to lift it up and move it somewhere else. Now, this is one of my favorites. There was a company I worked at years ago who developed this type of structural member for geodesic domes. So they were basically saying, let's do the network of the dome out of an I section. 
But then they said, well, we need some connector material and uh, we need some waterproofing and let's extrude this entire thing so that all this extra material which we initially added for waterproofing and connectivity is actually fully integral to this eye section and as a consequence the entire structure is going to be much more efficient. Now what was happening in this is these struts got welded into an octagonal network typical of a geodesic dome and then formed metal panels came over this edge and there was a neoprene rod right there. Neoprene is soft enough that you can squeeze it and make it waterproof. So that rod came around and the panel came down and mashed the rod and then came across and got bolted through this hole. Now the beauty to that is this bolt hole if it leaks it leaks straight into this which is the gutter for the roof. So you're not connecting together in any way where the bolt holes or the connectors have to be waterproof. So all this frame was welded together so that part was waterproof and then the only thing was to attach these panels so that they would also be waterproof also. And this is just another view of that showing these little grooves for the neoprene rod and this, the roof panels would come over that. Uh, I keep doing that. Um, so, let's talk about a few more common examples. Uh, this is a standard kind of mullion system. In this case, it's another example, by the way, where the structure and all the little connections and everything are extruded in one operation so it's unbelievably efficient and it's structurally very sound and it's very weatherable so in every conceivable way it's working really well so the basic structure is this tube you see these little indents which have neoprene extruded shapes that get uh, snapped into them and you'll notice something here this neoprene comes across and it turns up a little edge there. And you kind of need to do that because a wide face of neoprene like this may not mash down well enough to give you good water seal. So what you got is this fairly flexible thin edge which is going to adapt in thickness to whatever is necessary to make the proper seal with the glass. So there's going to be a piece of glass that comes in here piece of glass in here and then we're going to come over the top of this and screw something down to it. So what we screw down are this aluminum extrusion with these neoprene fittings. Now there's something really cool here. Um, it's, it's a bear to line up a screw hole in this piece of aluminum with a screw hole in that piece of aluminum. One of the things that's absolutely brilliant here is that you can get that screw going anywhere into this groove you want to and as long as it bites down into the groove you don't care where along the groove it's occurring so there's no meticulous alignment of holes that's necessary in the field you'll also notice this piece of neoprene here which absolutely squeezes around this screw and seals it properly and then when this entire thing is screwed down flat against the neoprene that's an additional seal against any leakage through this screw hole. Okay, so a couple of other comments that need to be made. Um, we don't want screws exposed on the outside of our building, partly for visual reasons. But we also don't want burglars to be able to come along and unscrew the screws and uh, gain access to the building. So there's a third cap piece, which you'll notice right here, it has these little edges. And when you put it over this shape, which is sloped there and sloped there, and you start hammering from one end, it just snaps over that edge. And once that thing is in place, it's really difficult to remove. 
it requires a special tool and I suspect most burglars don't think enough to go buy one of those tools to help them access the building. Uh, as a consequence, you pretty much eliminate that as a threat um, and you also create this beautiful, clean, finished element here. So you don't need to worry too much about the appearance of this intermediate piece uh, because nobody's going to see it anyway. Another point I want to make is you'll notice this thing is not centered, which is really significant. What's significant about that is we're supposed to have... <coughs> We're supposed to have three quarters of an inch of overlap between the insulated glass panel and this backing surface, or for that matter, this surface which holds the glass in place. Um, on the other hand, you can't make it exactly three quarters of an inch on both sides because we can't <coughs> manufacture or construct anything to that level of tolerance. So what we got is three quarters of an inch of spacing from there to there. And when the glass gets installed, the installers just shove it up against this face. And that means they know for that piece they got three quarters of an inch. Then on the next mullion over, they do the same thing. And whatever uh, extra gap has been created exists on this side. So we get three quarters, at least three quarters of an inch of overlap on either side. Uh, this is not just to accommodate construction tolerances. Uh, glass can get very hot and can do so at a differential to the rest of the building. So you've got to be able to uh, count on expansion and contraction. And this extra space on this side is where that occurs, that opportunity occurs. So this is a really basic kind of mullion system. If that's three quarters of an inch and this is three quarters, you'll notice this thing is probably about two and a quarter overall and for sort of basic mullions it's really hard to do much less than that because uh, you got to have a three quarter inch lap on each side um, and then you got to have some wiggle room for the glass uh, you can do something a little tighter or more uh, less visible in the nature of uh, silicone head joints or something like that but Generally, for the structural part of the mullion system, it's hard to do less than two inches here. And typically, it's going to be more like two and a quarter or two and a half. Okay, here's one more example. <coughs> this is a product called Lightwall. Uh, uh, I'm under the impression it's pretty much of a ripoff of Cowwall. Um, but the two systems are very similar. Basically, we have a little aluminum eye extrusion here, which by the way, because this is a very narrow thing and thin, we've curled the edges down. We, we wouldn't be able to do that with a roller system in steel, but we can do it in aluminum. And then they, down here, they've not only provided this slot, but they're using screws that don't have really good cutting edges. So they're zigzagging the slot with depressions so that once the screw digs in there, you get really excellent uh, shear resistance in terms of the pullout of that screw. Um, you'll notice that this is a beam-like element, and as a consequence, as you screw it down, you induce bending in this. As this neoprene gasket presses down on this eye section, so there's some bending up here, and you'll notice they've made this thickest at the middle, and it kind of progresses out to shallower near the ends. You also see this little element here, which reduces the exposure of the edge of the neoprene, helps hold the neoprene in, but also is a really excellent way of sort of locally deforming the neoprene to assure that you have a good connection. And by the way, this curling up also, sometimes there are condensation issues in here. And uh, that curling up is a, is a way to run some of the conduit, uh, condensate uh, away from uh, places where it might drip into the building. These panels, by the way, this is aluminum. Uh, this is aluminum in this case. And this is what we call a stressed skin panel where the top and bottom sheets on it 
will be something like uh, glass fiber reinforced polyester or something like that. Uh, I'm not that terribly familiar with this particular product, but Calwall has a very, very long history of producing these uh, polyester reinforced uh, panels, uh, polyester panels reinforced with glass fiber. They've, uh, they claim to have developed materials that can go for 25 years or so without yellowing significantly. I don't, I have not tested that, but they've been in business for quite a while and they're working on it. These stress skin panels, you can also get filled with aerogel. Um, and also the Calwell people have done a version of this where this web right here is more of the material that's used on that skin, which has a much lower thermal cond conductivity. So some of the heat loss and the tendency toward, towards condensate are taken care of. That ends our introduction to the structural properties of aluminum.